about to pray. And uh, it's about uh, 12 o'clock here. And uh, I, my goal is to get you out before the evening service. So uh, we're going to look at a small passage of Scripture, Psalm 119. Oh, wait, not to Psalm 119. Uh, Luke 18. Luke chapter 18. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse number 1. And uh, I'll uh, plan not to be too long here, but uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse number 1. This is the theme verse of the men's meeting. I didn't know. Uh, it was actually Pastor Soto uh, there in Natomas when I was talking about the men's meeting. I said, I don't even know what to call it. And uh, he's a big football fan. He said, why don't you call it the two-minute warning? And so he explained it, you know, that definition of the two-minute warning. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. And then I'm like, I don't even know what verse to use. And uh, he's like, what about Luke 18, 1? I'm like, all right, <laughs> that, works, well, that works well. So uh, Luke 18 and verse number 1, it says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, there is, uh, so the best men that I know are because they are men of prayer. And uh, certainly, uh, whenever the subject of prayer is brought up, it brings conviction to our hearts. Uh, you know, has your prayer life gotten better this year than it was last year? Uh, one of my friends, he says, every year I get evaluated. I have my sales grown. You know, have I become more productive in my job? And I'm supposed to increase. Has your prayer life increased over this last year? We all ought to be growing in the matter of prayer. Now, there are Christians that are fainting in America because of the sin of prayerlessness. Now, Christ has concluded uh, Luke chapter 17, talking about the last days and that the fact that he would be coming again. And he likened the last days, the days of Noah, that they would be difficult days, days that would not be conducive to faith. So now he talks to them about having faith, having a life of faith, and days that are devoid of faith. Uh, there's, uh, uh, this verse right here is so pertinent for our hour. Uh, J. Bernard McGee says about this verse, he opens two alternatives to any man who is living in difficult days. You and I have to do one of the two. You will either have to make up your mind and you'll do. You'll either, men in difficult days will either faint or they'll pray. Either there'll be days of fear or there'll be days of faith. And certainly there is days of fear right now and there's fainting. And so it, it's a call for us to get to this place of prayer. Now, we see how, who, who are to pray. Who is Christ speaking to? It says men ought always to pray. He's calling us men out that we are to take the lead, to take our role here in this matter of prayer. Men are to be leaders in the matter of prayer. First Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together, the grace of life, why? That your prayers be not hindered. And, and uh, you know, here a husband, he, a uh, husband cares, he cultivates the ground, and you're to care and cultivate the heart of your wife, and, and uh, then to dwell, to abide, and then honor, to value, to cherish. There's no more important person in your life than your spouse. Uh, and, and uh, you know, forsaking all others, cleaving unto her. And then the weaker vessel, you are to lead her. You are to spiritually disciple your wife. Uh, you say, well, she's more spiritual than, than I am. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that exception. <laughs> uh, you know, the weaker vessel. And then why? Heirs together. Uh, my goal ought to be to make the judgment seat of Christ as best as I can for Megan. I want there to be gold, silver, and precious stone when she stands before the judgment seat of Christ. And so I want to help her to grow in those areas. And a schism relationship with your spouse can be reasons why your prayers are, not hinder, are, are hindered. And, uh, and so many times we men neglect, negate the role that God has given us as a spiritual leader in our home and to our wives. Uh, you, know, you say, oh, they're better at praying than we are. Uh, they uh, spend more time in prayer. They're able to spend more time in prayer. Or, or uh, you, know, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if you say, well, they're, they have a greater burden for souls or, or uh, they're better at ministry than I am. They have a deeper hunger for God's word. Uh, you know, the husband's to be the head of the wife unless all of those things happen, Right. No, I, there's no exception about that. It doesn't matter whether your wife has more of a heart for God than you do. And who says that you can't get more of a heart for God? Who says that you can't grow in this matter of prayer, grow in the matter of spending time in his word? Uh, great uh, uh, answer to prayer and things that God did in our men's meeting a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, on a Saturday morning, we have our 7.30 prayer time. Again, these, 
all those sessions are extremely important. That 7.30 prayer time, what's one thing that God's done in that? Uh, I was uh, speaking about the Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 and praying impossible prayers. And one pastor got a hold of that. He went back to this church and, and, uh, and he says, you know, we, we aren't praying big enough prayers. What are some things that are impossible? And so Wednesday night, he says, let's open up. What are some things we can pray for that are impossible? One lady says, it, it, to me, it would be impossible for my husband to come to church. And, you know, and I know the family, I know the couple and things. And, and uh, yeah, that guy, he didn't have any heart for God. And he's saved, but he didn't have any heart for God. And so the church began to pray for that impossible request. The next year, the pastor shows up and he says, Tim, I got to tell you. Uh, I said, he says, what happened? And so he tells me this story. They begin to pray for this. The, that man begins to come Sunday morning, begins to come Sunday school, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The pastor begins to disciple him. He says, Tim, a year later, he is more on fire for God than she is. <laughs> and uh, he's coming to the men's meeting. You know, what can God do? Uh, God can do the impossible. And, you know, you can take your, you know, this, this matter of the spiritual leadership. It's God's calling us men out to be men of prayer. And so uh, we are to, as, as a husband, we are to be the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And so, uh, you know, we are to take the lead. And then it's our duty to do so. He says men ought always to pray. It is a, necess a necessity. And God wants to hear your prayers. God wants to answer your prayers. He didn't just want to answer my prayers or pastor's prayers. He wants to answer your prayers. Psalm 102, verse 17, he will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. Pastor preached last year, an ambassador, and uh, one of the uh, girls that, that uh, in one of the groups uh, texted Megan and I and said uh, God really used uh, him in her life and, and was talking about the lies that we believe. And she says, I got a pad of paper out. I began to write down what are some lies I've been believing. And one of those lies was God doesn't want to hear my prayers. Maybe you're believing that lie. Stop it. <laughs> you know, God wants to hear your prayers. God wants to answer prayers. John, uh, Jeremiah 29, 12. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The problem is not unanswered prayer. The problem is unoffered prayer. What are you asking God to do? What are you asking God for? He invites us to pray. He invites us to seek him. The door's open. Go through the door. Get to that place of prayer. And then when God answers a prayer, write it down. Write down those answers to prayer. Uh, and then rehearse it. It will encourage and increase your faith. Thank God uh, for what he's done. So who are to pray? Men. And then when should we, they pray? When should we pray? And it's always. Men are always to pray. So at all times. Prayer is to be continuous. That means all throughout the day. You know, I believe we ought to have that certain time of the day where we spend in prayer, but even as you're at work, you can be in the spirit of prayer. As you're dealing with that, that uh, coworker that uh, just irritates you, you can be in that spirit of prayer. That customer that, that you're having a difficulty with, God can give you wisdom. You ask him. He can help you with your customers. Uh, I remember uh, years ago, Pastor Hedra, downtown Baptist, uh, walked in on his son who uh, works uh, with insurance and things, and, and his son was on his knees praying. And, uh, and later on, he's like, son, what were you doing? And he says, well, I didn't know what to do in this certain situation. I was asking God for wisdom. And God showed me exactly what I needed to do. God wants to, to be involved all throughout your day. Not just that one, you know, we've gotten somewhere in our thinking that we just need to seek God just in the morning and that's it. No, we need him all throughout the day. Uh, you know, every hour I need thee. Or as the other hymn writer said, moment by moment. It should be, prayer should be like breathing. Like we're just all throughout the day, we're in that spirit of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always. So you don't have to have your eyes closed when you pray. You can watch, especially when you're driving. Uh, you know, keep your eyes open and pray. Romans 12, 12, uh, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Philippians 4, 6, be careful nothing but, it, by, uh, but in everything, but, uh, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And so pray and thank God. Thank God for the answers to prayer. First Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. And then the psalmist said in Psalm 55, verse 17, evening, morning, and at noon will I pray. 
and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Prayer is more than an attitude of the life. It's, an, or it's more than, than an action lips. It's an attitude of the life. We're to walk in the Spirit. Walking is a step-by-step process. And so it's a one step at a time. And so why should, uh, you know, who are to pray? Men, when should we pray? Always. And then lastly, why should we pray? So we don't faint. So we don't quit. So we don't give up. The word faint means to be utterly spiritless, to be wearied out, exhausted. You ever been there? In ministry, it's exhausting. And I, a couple of years ago, God, I, I went through a time, uh, two years ago, I went through a time where I was just depleted. And, uh, you know, you're still doing ministry. And this year has been more ministry than I've ever had in my life. And, uh, and I learned from that two years ago. And what I learned is that when it gets busier and it gets harder, I need to spend more time in prayer. In that time at uh, Ambassador, you know, God's getting me up at four or five. Do you want to sleep? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I, want to, I want to sleep, but I can't. I need God more. I need to spend that time more right now. And as I'm going through that intense time, because I'm giving out, giving out, giving out, I've got to put back in, or I'm going to faint. I'm going to be exhausted. I'm going to quit. And so we've got to get alone and get to God so that we don't faint, we don't give up. Uh, and uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we faint not. Someone likened our society to a rotting corpse, uh, and the atmosphere in which we breathe is like death. And yet, where do we get our life? It's in that prayer closet. It's in our time in the scriptures. That's where we get to breathe the pure heavenly air and back into our lives. And we have to have it. And, and this time, in this day and age, we've got to spend time with the Lord. Get that, that pure air of heaven back that will help keep you from fainting. Mark, or Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, here's Christ. He's at the Garden of Gethsemane. What's he doing? He's praying. Uh, and he gives us that example. And he asks his disciples to pray. And he says, what? Could you not watch and pray with me for one hour? You give an hour of time to prayer. Have you ever prayed for an hour? I'd encourage you to, to and challenge you to that. Spend the time with the Lord in prayer and, uh, and seek his face. Luke 1, uh, Luke 11, verse 1, it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Charles Spurgeon said, I'd rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. I challenged the, uh, that evangelistic preaching class, you know, Acts 6-4, but we'll give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. Many times as preachers, we can be strong in the ministry of the word, and yet, where we get attacked most is the area of prayer. I mean, I get attacked. I mean, I, prayer is, is a great strength of me, but it's a great weakness. John R. Rice said, all failures are prayer failures. And, and we get attacked here in the area of prayer more than any other area. And so we've got to guard that time, protect that time. Prayer is the language of the helpless. And so I, I look at this verse, and it says, men are always to pray and not to faint. And what I learned from this is that you can endure a lot if you walk with God. You can go through a lot in your life if you stay close to the Savior. So uh, Proverbs 24, 10, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. But where do we find strength? Where do we get our strength to live this Christian life? It's, it's more of a, a who than a where. Isaiah 40, verse 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, ne there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Sometimes all the devil wants to do is to get the fight out of you. So you'll quit where you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't spend the time in God's word like he wants you anymore, where you can start missing church and it's okay. He wants you to quit. I read a book or finished a book on holiness. Uh, I think it was about a 500-page book. It took me a while. And uh, one of the things that stood out to me, he says, I'm not asking if you're winning. I'm asking if you're fighting. Are you fighting? Are you resisting the devil? Are you, or have you quit? 
Have you fainted? Oh, you get back that prayer closet. Get the strength from the, from the Lord that you need. And so uh, he says in, in Psalm 71, 16, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Do you feel like quitting? Then get to prayer. Get to that prayer closet. Do you get discouraged? Get to that prayer closet. It's a call to pray. A discouragement ought to cause us to run to Christ in, the, in, the, in a place of prayer. You find your strength and victory through prayer. It's prayer and the word of God. And I'm not trying just to emphasize just prayer. They go hand in hand. Uh, we need them both. And so God wants to use us in this matter of prayer. And, and, uh, and we need the Lord. With the men's meeting, I need the Lord in our ministry. Uh, I can't do this without him. Uh, he's uh, shown me time and time again that I'm nothing without prayer. And that this next year, that this year that we have coming up, the two months, we're nothing without God. What do we have to offer these men, God? <laughs> How are we going to get them? Through prayer. <laughs> through spending time with him, seeking his face. And what can God do uh, through us and through this men's meeting? In closing, I, uh, I've shared this once before, but a couple years ago, two years ago, I believe it was, uh, John Getch was preaching on the Friday night service, he was preaching about revival. I'm on the second row on the left side or your right and, uh, and the Lord's just moving in an unusual way in my mind. And any time uh, that, you know, the Lord, I, I don't want to quench the spirit. I don't want to grieve the spirit. If he's moving in, a, and in such a way, I, I want to be sensitive. It's like, you know, catching the wind of a sail. And, and so uh, the Lord's just kind of quietly speaking to my heart and, and uh, just impressing upon me, I want another prayer time. Now, we pray many times during our men's meeting. And I'm like, okay, but, you know, this is getting late. You know, what do we do? And I, I didn't quite know what God wanted. And, and so uh, I got up. It was 9 o'clock. And I said, now, uh, men, you know, uh, I, I'm going to be in the fellowship hall at 9.15. I said, if God has touched your heart and, uh, and, you, and you want to pray some more, I'm going to be in there and uh, we'll have another time of prayer. I said, if God has touched your heart, you know, go uh, to a hotel, get checked in, go back home. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. And just come, you know, we have a prayer service at 7.30 if you want to come to that. And and so I try not to make it, you know, any pressure or anything like that. And, and, you know, some of these guys, I mean, they've come from Oregon. They've come from Nevada. They've driven, you know, four to eight hours or so. And, and uh, you know, it's a long day. And so, uh, you know, if it's me, I'd want to get back to the hotel and get some rest. And, uh, and so I go in there into the fellowship hall at 914. And there's a, uh, an older gentleman, probably in his upper 70s. And, and uh, he's sitting there and it's just him. It's 914, one guy. I thought, wow, 200 men have shown up, you know, 30, 35 churches, and there's one guy that's come here to pray. And I, uh, this man, I didn't know him. Uh, he said, uh, he's my first time here. He said, I'm from Nevada. And he says, I, I can't wait to get home and tell my wife all that God's done in my life just this day. <laughs> he was so excited about what God had done in his heart. And so we talk a little bit. He's like, is it just us two tonight? I said, it looks like it. And so I'm kind of waiting a little bit. And then a man from Oregon comes through a side door, uh, and, uh, and he says, is the prayer meeting in here, or is it in the fellowship hall, which he was talking about, the back of the L-shaped building. Uh, he says, or is it in the fellowship hall, because there's nine of us, or uh, right, nine other guys that are waiting for that prayer time. And I said, uh, it's back there. And so uh, we go back there, and now there's 12 of us. And I sit down, and they're all looking at me like, how are we going to pray? I didn't tell them this, but I'm like, I have no clue. I don't know why we're here. I don't know why God's called for this, for this prayer time. I don't know what we're doing. Uh, I just know God wants us to pray. I have no idea what to do. And uh, so I said, well, let's have a little bit of testimony on what God's doing in your heart. And so we're kind of sharing. And, and then one man said, or one pastor, he says, uh, well, Tim, you've seen God take it to a next, the next level. He says, what do you need? Well, what's the next level? And I, immediately I thought of Nehemiah, confession of sin. I said, we got to get clean before God. So we had some times of confession and and things, and uh, confessing sin of our state and different things. But, but uh, some guys, you know, as we're having different rounds of prayer, some guys are just sitting in their seat. They're not emotional, you know. They're just praying. And then other guys, they're on the floor, and they're weeping. Uh, and we, we prayed for a while. Um, and uh, uh, there was uh, uh, one time uh, that uh, there was a, a young man that uh, uh, he got real honest uh, with us men. And uh, he confessed some things to us that he needed prayer over. And so uh, I then re, uh, rehearsed this to the, all the men. I said, I was at a uh, conference one time, and there was a man that, that was very burdened for his church. He says, our pastor did not have a heart for souls, did not have a heart for revival, was not using evangelists. And he says, our church was just so dead. 
And another man and I coveted, like, you know, we're going to start praying on Wednesday night after Wednesday night prayer meeting. We're going to get into another room. After everybody's gone, we're just going to pray. We're going to ask God to revive our church, revive our pastor. And so uh, they began to pray, and they started doing that for several months, and it grew uh, by a couple of other men. And, and then one man came to them and, and said, uh, can I come to that Wednesday night prayer meeting with you guys? And he said, sure. And he'd been coming to the church for a couple months, and he, said, uh, he says to them that Wednesday night, he says, uh, guys, he says, I'm saved, I'm born again, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but he says, I'm an alcoholic. He says, I just can't get victory over alcohol. And he says, would you pray over me with that? And so they all gathered around him, and they began to pray over him. And he, the man leading the meeting, began to pray one of these prayers. God, I pray that you would take it away from him right now. And uh, as he starts praying one of those prayers, God just speaks to his heart, says, stop your praying. I just did. I just took it away from you. And, uh, and so he stops, and he says, I think God just took it away from him, from, from you. And, and uh, the man says, oh, I know he did. And I'm in this session, this, this layman, he's telling the story. And he says, you say, that doesn't work. He says, that was over two years ago, and the man hasn't had a drop of alcohol since. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another. Pray you one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I said, Ben, let's gather around this guy, and let's pray over him. His name is Brandon. And, uh, and so we began to pray over him. And I, and I told about Brandon. I've known him for many years. His Christianity is a strobe light. It's off and it's on. It's off and it's on. And it's, he's up and down. Just That's, that's his Christianity. I mean, the times I've been in the church where he's at, uh, he's been the front row and he's been the back row. And so, you know, he, and he, yet he's called to preach. And I said, God's called him to preach and he believes he wants to be an evangelist and, and that type of thing. And I said, but he's not going to get where he's going to go unless he gets serious with God. And, and so let's get over there and pray over him. And so we began to pray over him. I think we ended our prayer meeting about 1130 that night. And uh, almost every single one of those men were there at the 730 prayer meeting. I asked one man, I said, what did you think of the prayer meeting last night? He's like, not what I was expecting. I'm like, okay. Uh, and then two other guys, I said, what did uh, you think of the prayer meeting that last night? And they said, life-changing. I don't know what that means. They never elaborated on that. That's all I knew until a year ago in August when Brandon's pastor called me. And he says, Tim, I want to tell you that uh, that prayer meeting that you had over Brandon, that prayer time, changed his life. He says, Tim, you know him. He's up and down all the time. But he says, since then... Since that men's meeting, he says he's been all in. He says it's not that he hasn't struggled, but he has been sold out to God ever since. He says, Tim, he's moving from Nevada. He's moving to North Carolina, and he's just enrolled at Ambassador Baptist College. <laughs> Brandon has started now his second year at Ambassador, majoring in evangelism. And God has changed him. It's amazing what God has done in his life. When I was there at the school, one of the teachers was like, oh, your, your brother Schmidt, you, uh, you run that men's meeting in California, don't you, that, that helped change Brandon's life. I said, yeah, you know, God's really used it in some great ways. You know, God can use our church, not just in the past, but he can use them this year as well. Amen. There's still more men to reach. Of course, we need help too, don't we? <laughs> and uh, God, God doesn't just want to work on these men that are coming. God wants to work on us. So how's your prayer life? Do you see your need of God? Do you feel desperate for the Lord? And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to fear.